Hey, uh, hi, hey, 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 good to see you. Good to see hi. you. Hi, Hey, Joe. Uh, should we test the slides? Or? Yes, please. Um, yeah, why don't you see how they look? Uh, let's see. Share screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. Can you try the slideshow? Okay, let me give it a second. Looks good. Right, all fine, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you also hear me uh, clearly? Or? Yeah, yeah, the, it sounds really good. The, okay, the great. Really good. great. Thank you. Sure. Huangju, you want to try? Hi, how are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, right now it shows that I can share my screen. Oh, um, okay. Um, yeah. Ah, do you want to stop? Can you stop sharing your screen, Wei? Oh, okay. Let me see. Let me see. I can do it. I can do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. There you go. Okay. Let can me. Can you try it? Yeah. Sure. Uh, sorry. E. Yeah, I don't know. It's a problem. What do you see? I didn't see anything. Do you click the green share button, share screen button? Yes. And then what comes up? Comes a white oh. like, screen. Okay. So you might have to um, set up your preferences in, um, are you on a Mac? Yes, but I tried it yesterday, it's okay. So oh, okay. more than one screen, maybe you uh, more than one screen you choose the, the not the you know secondary one. Yeah, it looks maybe weird. Maybe yeah, let me let me let me uh, leave the new zoom and then come in again. Okay, and you might need to close PowerPoint and reopen it or something like that. So Aaron, you still in, uh, in China or in? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm in Shanghai, but um, I'm, I'm coming back this week. I see, oh, cool. So, I mean, I, I, I didn't know that you, you have a lab there or? No, no, just a sabbatical. Okay, cool. cool. Oh. There we go. Looks good. Looks great. Looks good. Uh, and you're still muted, Huangju. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it look, looks very good. Oh, you're muted again. I see, I see. So you can hear me, right? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. And then whenever you're ready, you could stop Zoom, stop sharing. I just have like an introduction first. Do you know how to stop the share? Yeah, I stopped share, sharing. Do you know how to stop sharing? Yeah, I have already stopped sharing, I think. Oh, somehow. Oh, ah, there you go. Okay. Okay.
Carol. Hey, it's on. Hey, it's anyway. Hey, nice to see it's you. Yeah. I'm so okay. excited. T tomorrow is the day, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 I like when I when I saw the news that June first would open, I immediately called um, <laughs> the Peninsula Hotel and I said, Is your roof deck bar open? And they said, No, not yet. But I think we'll have to find some other place to celebrate. Uh, yeah, and then next week, maybe. So some of the stores it's, and it's basically open here. Like our Shachu just letting us out now and just going. going yeah, around. yeah, yeah. I heard. Yeah, it's basically done. But I think, um, but the pain is going to be now. Now you have to go to these testing sites all the time. Yeah, inside, right? Do that like twice, three times a week. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be so funny. But anyway, we can, we can work. We can go to work. So it's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the lab is open in Shanghai or still a few more? The, days? Now it's total lockdown. So uh, we lockdown. hope we can open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be next, next week. We definitely should be able to go to, go to work. Um, mm. Wow. But some graduate students will still need to see at least posters and stuff. Mm -hmm. Why yeah. can't the graduate students come back? Because student, some graduate students stay in dorms. We have a, a tricky problem. When we leave the dorm, when they come back, there's some risk, I guess. That's some oh. tricky part. So, so what happens to you guys like mouse line or monkey line? Oh, you know, is that... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people kept it. Uh, um, so facility people kept it for about two, over two months. Wow. That's still fine. That's not. Uh, we we're not being asking to uh, reduce the lines. Mm -hmm. I think, um, but still, everything is shut down. We a lot, a lot of mouths we inject the virus. So it's supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, starting an experiment in March, but now it's. <laughs> I mean, it's good. It did not last time to us. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of good yeah. you guys uh, did not ask to reduce the line. I remember, yeah, 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 two years ago, you know, when the start of the pandemic, yeah. we actually asked to uh, reduce the mouse cage. Yeah. yeah, I heard, I heard that's that'd be a very tough time, and it's so, yeah. so hard to come back, right? So, they they, they uh stored uh, a lot of stuff, the food, mouse food previously before they locked down. Right. So hold on, hold on for two months. Right. Right. <laughs> it will, a few more months, uh, it's gonna be tough. Um, yeah, uh, since uh, still, still a lot of people working there. So yeah, mm -hmm. also for monkey stuff. Um, for all facility people living inside, on site. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, Do they get extra extra pay? Uh, I guess definitely. Yeah, I hope so. I, I hope I, so. I'm not sure how much. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. They deserve it. Yeah. So it's long. I'm I'm taking off on Thursday. Yeah. Back to California. Yes. So yeah. Now you don't have to worry. Definitely all the flight and traffic, uh, taxi should be fine, right? Yeah, but I'd already reserved a car to the airport. That's pretty expensive. <laughs> okay. So. <it's, laughs> That's okay. Should take a few more thousand years. Yeah. Um, now the next thing. Not, not flights is, should, be, should be fine, right? Mm. I, I hope so. The mm -hmm. next thing is hopefully they can start reducing the quarantine on the way back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's that's all right. Some like reducing. Um, they're not requiring a, a lot more COVID tests before the flight. When you come back, yeah. no, but when you come back, it's still fourteen days. Hey, Yanin. Hi, guys. Hey, uh, Yanin. Uh -huh. Hi, Jun. Hi, Yanin. I see you have a haircut, Zhuang. I can. That, that was like the first thing everyone wanted to do when the lockdown was ending, <laughs> get haircuts. Yeah. Yeah. 
I came out here last week and then said, oh, open wow. this week. <laughs> Someone smuggled a uh, hair cutter, hairdresser into our shaochu and then everyone yeah. was getting haircuts. And then someone like told the neighborhood community and then they got, everyone got in trouble. Uh, no, the, no, the, no. the the video line, so line is so long, so I yeah, do that. Yeah. All right. Somebody in the back. Oh. So it's along, should we? Sure, sure, go ahead, yeah. Get started, mm -hmm. great. Okay. Um, okay, hi everyone, welcome to um, uh, Shanghai lockdown ending edition of NeuroZoom. <laughs> so we, we made it two long months and looks like we'll get our freedom. Thanks for everyone for joining and um, we're gonna keep going over the summer and um, complete uh, with more exciting talks, it was, uh, even though we were locked out, it was fun every week to stay in touch with everyone and talk about great science. So we have awesome, awesome speakers today. And uh, just to advertise next week, um, we have uh, Sin Jean um, from East China Normal University and uh, uh, Roy Lin from uh, NIBS. He's um, actually going to be a, a, a faculty position at, at NIBS um, from from him in Law's lab, so so um, please join. He has an exciting new uh, new results. Okay, with that we'll start um, with uh, Huang Zhu and um, Zilong. Do you want to introduce her, please? Sure, sure, great. It's my great pleasure to <clears throat> to introduce Ji. So I still remember. So when I first started my lab in two thousand nine, I learned the Ji uh, as as uh, as a graduate student, as on, on her way to graduation. Uh, so I uh, just graduated, I believe. So so uh, she come to my lab and said uh, she will uh, she will to the post office. Uh, I got money. So so Ju has uh, is a Iowan alumni. She she did post office uh, 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 professor or Wang Zhuoren, where she learned the uh, superior uh, electric fields to to make recording on the fly neurons. So it, whereas uh, made the first uh, neural paper of Zhuoren's lab, uh, which is quite, quite remarkable. So in post on uh, that Bonnie's lab, uh, Ju has learned and uh, applied the uh, active physiology uh, as well as many mouse genetic works to study neural development. So uh, Ju has come back to China to start her own lab in uh, School of Medicine, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So uh, where she has a, a, a series of interesting findings. So today she will talk about uh, excitatory uh, SST neuron in the immediate paralympistical uh, the, the nucleus, which is uh, involved in uh, repetitive behavior and also being uh, asso uh, associated with reward. Okay, welcome, Ji. Hi, Enjoy. good morning. Hi, mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, good morning, everyone. And uh, first, uh, I would like to thank Zilong and Aaron for inviting me uh, and giving me the chance to give a new Zoom research talk. And thanks, Zilong, for the detailed introduction of my research background. And uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So it's good to see, right? Yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, so I'm uh, Zhu Huang from Shanghai Jiao Tong University School of Medicine. And my lab is interested in studying the neurocircuitry level mechanism in the innate behavior in these years. And today I'm going to talk about an unpublished study about the excitatory SST neurons in the medium paralaminiscal nucleus control repetitive behavior and encoder reward. In humans, obsessive compulsive disorders and body focused repetitive behaviors are related neuropsychiatric disorders, both involve the repetitive behaviors. While OCDs are more related to compulsive mental thoughts, the BFRBs solely involve physical repetitive behavior towards the body, such as hair pulling, skin picking, nail biting, and among others. 
In rodents, self-grooming uh, is one of the most frequently ob um, observed repetitive behaviors, which comprises repeated stereotyped movements sequentially from the nose to the face and into the head with ending in body licking. Self-grooming is a sensitive behavioral marker of stress. It is frequently observed in many rodent models of neuropsychiatry disorders. In addition to the OCD's BFIBs, this behavior can often be observed in other rodent models of neuropsychiatry check disorders such as ASD and ADHD. The known self-grooming related brain regions in rodents include the orbital frontal cortex, the ventral media strides, and the amygdala, uh, the lateral septum, the PAG, LHA, cerebellum, and two recent studies published in Nature Neuroscience and Neuron last year identified the ventral strides and islands of Kalaja and the spinal tragment nucleus at P5C in controlling self grooming. But back to the 1980s, um, earlier works using the decelerated rats showed that the massing dephalic deceleration will the midbrain is intact, it actually did not affect the initiation and syntax pattern of self-grooming. Although these mouse have difficulty in completing the full pattern of self-grooming, so this indicates that the neuroaxis below the midbrain might be the targets of the forebrain control networks involved self-grooming. So in our study, we identified the brain regions called the median paralaminiscal nucleus, MPL, which is located in the rostral ponds in the midbrain. This nucleus contains a group of acid-departed neurons and is laterally bordered by the auditory relay nucleus, lateral laminiscus. So its name is a media, medial paralaminiscal nucleus. More than just understanding the neural circuitry involving uh, in the regulation of that bromine, uh, what we want to know more about what is your psychological relevance of repetitive behavior. Considering that in humans, the OCD cycle involves a loop from the anxiety to relief. So we suspected that is reward the driving force for this repetitive behavior. And in stressful conditions, can these repetitive behaviors be used as a means of anxiety regulation to cope with stress? So the first insight into the MPL being functionally involved in self-grooming originated from an experiment where we observed significantly induced self-grooming when we applied optogenetic stimulation in the LHA in the SST CRE AI32 mouse. But we did not find the SST positive neurons in the LHA. So we started to look for the LHA projecting SST T positive neurons across the brain. And by injecting the retrograde transported AAVs expressing cre dependent EGFP in the SST CRE mice. And after a long term unbiased screen, we identified a group of EGFP positive neurons which projection, uh, projecting to the LHA. And uh, uh, the EGFP positive neurons located in the, nucle in the nucleus MPL. And we found that the LH projecting MPL neurons is a subset of the SST positive neuron in this nucleus. And later we validated that optogenetic activation of the MPL SD neurons or optogenetic activation of the LH projecting MPL SD neurons both induce a significant increase in self grooming. And we found that the higher the uh, photo stimulation, the, uh, the longer the grooming time and the shorter the grooming latency. Prolonged activation of these neurons uh, in the mouse with HM3D expression um, displayed a persistent increase of self-grooming for no less than two hours after CNO injection. So, this validate that the activation of MPRSD neurons evoked a robust self-grooming. 
Then we conducted more characterization of these neurons by performing a single molecular RNA uh, uh, fish with the SST probe. We counted the numbers of these neurons in the MPO and found there are approximately 1,300 SST part neurons in this nucleus. Then we performed spatial transcriptome analysis uh, by the 10X platform in the, in the tissue sections to profile the potential marker genes in the MPL. Um, after dimensionality reduction and clustering, um, the neurons in this uh, tissue sections can be divided into uh, 14 clusters and the number 13 uh, represent neurons in the MPL. Among the differentially expressed genes enriched in the MPL, we found that PDH2, SST, and other threes are among the top five ranking uh, DEGs enriched in the MPL. If we mapped the PDH2 and the SST transcripts back to the tissue section and the TSNI plot, plot, we can observe that the uh, SST and PTH2 are pretty specifically enriched in the MPL, especially the PTH2. We confirmed the expression by because uh, spatial transcriptome is not single cell resolution, so we performed an scope to uh, look at their co-localization and it showed that the uh, PDH2 expressing neurons is a subset of SST positive neurons in this nucleus, and approximately 50% of the SST expression neurons co express PTH2. And both SST and PTH2s encode genes, uh, uh, encode the neuropep uh, encode, encode neuropeptides. And uh, if we look at number 13, then we can find that in addition to the expression of ST and PTH2, the neurons in the MPR also express the excitatory neuronal markers v 2 were, but were lack of the expression of inhibitory neuronal markers VGAT, GAT1, and GAT2. We confirmed this by anescope and showed that as the, as almost all the ST part of neurons express v 2 uh, but not VGAT. So this indicated that in, in the MPL, almost all the ST neurons are grammaturgic neurons. And later we confirmed that these neurons are excitatory grammaturgic neurons by electrophysiology. So, and considering that about half of the ST neurons express PTH2. So actually in this nucleus that's, um, about half of the ST neurons express like release the glutamate, glutamate SST and PTH2 and half release glutamate and SST, but not PTH2. Then we performed fiber photometry recording to measure the um, calcium signals from population of the MPR ST neurons. And we observed that the MPR ST neurons display a clear grooming related neural activities. The MPR ST, the MPR ST neurons show a robust uh, increase in calcium signals in, during the self grooming induced by different stimuli, regardless in the physiological conditions so or the spontaneous self grooming, or during self grooming in stressful conditions induced by body restraint, or during self grooming uh, in moderate arousal conditions uh, induced by like oil drop or water spraying onto the face. The increase of calcium signals in these neurons um, appears uh, immediately, bef uh, directly before the initiation of the grooming behavior and uh, um, remained elevated uh, throughout the whole process of the grooming behavior. Then we looked into the kinetics and uh, um, and look at the temporal relationship between the onset of calcium increase and the onset of grooming. And we, if we define the onset of calcium increase at, at the time, um, at the time when 
uh, the signal reached 15 percent of its peak value. So we find that the onset of calcium increase precedes the onset of grooming by about 300 milliseconds. This indicates that the activities of these neurons may contribute to the initiation of this behavior. We also observe a positive correlation between the magnitude of calcium signals and the the uh, and the duration then the bulk duration of grooming and the the larger the calcium signal the longer the bulk, bulk duration of self grooming so these so the part of correlation also indicate that these neurons may also contribute to the maintenance of this behavior Then we look into the upstream input to these neurons by IV-based retrograde tracing. For the purpose of a better specificity, we inject the IV drug gene into the downstream target of these neurons in the LA chain and the AVs in the MPL. And we found that um, the upstream input to the LHA projecting MPLSD neurons largely come from six brain regions, the CEA, BNST, VLPA, GPV, and IC, and AU. And uh, several of them are closely related to stress responses, such as the CEA, BNST, PVN. Then we demonstrate that activating the CA to MPL input neurons induce robust self grooming. We inject the retrograde transport to the AV CRE into the MPL and the AV expressing CRE de dependent CHR into each upstream input regions and in the white time mice. And we found that only activation of the, in, uh, the CA to MPL input neurons can induce self-grooming. The others like BNST to MPL, BLPH to MPL input neuron, if they are activated, act uh, instead inhibit self-grooming and the other three has no effect. Then we validate that the MPL ST neuron mediated self-grooming is triggered by inputs from the CEA. We target the HM4D into the MPRSD neurons and inject the retrograde transported AV flippos into the MPL and simultaneously inject the AV expressin flippo dependent CHR into the CEA. And we find that chemogenetic inhibition of the MPRSD neurons can significantly decrease the cell grooming induced by activating the CEA to MPL input. So this provides supporting evidence to demonstrate that the CEA to MPO input uh, triggers MPO induced uh, self grooming. Then we looked into the downstream output of these neurons by expressing the membrane GFP. In addition to the LHO, we also find that the neurons project to the VTA, DMH, VLPA, GPV, and MPO. Um, we performed optogenetic activation in each exon terminals, in each exon terminals, and we found that for uh, optogenetic uh, stimulation um, in the output to the VDA and the output to the LHA and the output to the VLPAG all induced uh, robust self grooming to a similar extent. And we performed the local perfusion of CNO to uh, locally inhibit the uh, external output to the VTA, LHA, and VLPAG. And we observed the sim similar effect, both uh, resulted in a significant re uh, decrease in the uh, self grooming behavior induced by restraint. So, actually, so, the, so to characterize the function of the uh, downstream output, we failed to uh, discriminate the differences between the out outputs to, to like VTA, LJ, and VLPAGs. So we think, so we want to uh, see in anatomy if these neurons send collateralized axons in a one to many configurations. 
and by pairwise retrograde tracing, so we inject the retrograde a transported AAV expressing create dependent TD tomato or create dependent EGFP into different combinations uh, of two downstream targets. And we found that uh, a large proportion of the MPRST neurons actually project axons to uh, two different uh, targets simultaneously. So indicated that these neurons send collateralized axons in a manner of one to many, not one to one man, one to one. So since these neurons innovate the VTA and the LHA, two brain regions very closely related to the reward. So we want to know, investigate uh, whether these neurons encode reward value in the condition in the condition pair preference uh, test, the, the mouse expressing CHR2 uh, in the MPRSD neurons uh, displayed a significant preference to stay in the chambers previously coupled with optogenetics uh, stimulation. So suggesting that activating these neurons is rewarding. And by intracranial self-stimulation test, we also find that uh, in the mouse with CHR2 expression, these neurons uh, display a significant increase in the cumulative FR1 port numbers and the P PR2 port numbers uh, towards the active port to deliver self stimulation. So, these findings also like uh, suggest that this activating these neurons is rewarding and sufficient to drive reinforcement as compared to the control mouse express and cherry. Then we compare the rows of the output to the VDA and the output to the LH in MPL induced reward. We found that optogenetic stimulation in output to the VTA induced a much stronger rewarding, rewarding effect as compared to uh, the mouse we applied uh, uh, optogenetic stimulation in the LHA. So this suggests that the output to the, uh, the VTA play a more crucial role in MPL induced reward. Recalling our finding that these neurons, at least half of these neurons, the MPL ST neurons correlate the neuropeptide ST and the PDH2. So we want to know why the neuropeptide ST or PDH2 facility the rewarding effect of these neurons. But CRISPR Cas9 mediated the genome editing. We knocked down the expression of the endogenous ST and PTH2. After confirming the knockdown efficiency, and we performed the intracranial self-stimulation assays and found uh, knocked down the expression of endogenous ST, but not the PTH. Uh, PDH2 uh, lead to a significant uh, decrease, uh, show a significant decrease in the FR1 point numbers and PR2 report numbers. So suggesting that the neuropeptide SST facilitating the rewarding effect of the MPL ST neuron, but not the PDH2. We haven't tested the effect of the grunate. Then we, then we demonstrate that the MPRSD neurons form excitatory synapse with the VTA DA neurons by in acute slices by CHR to assistant circuitry mapping and whole cell patch clamp recordings on the VTA dopamine neurons. Upon to the blue light stimulation, we recorded uh, Evoked EPSCs on the VTA domain neurons, and the evoked EPSCs can be completely blocked by the uh, grumate receptor antagonist CNQX, but not by the GABA uh, A receptor blocker PTX. And uh, the, TD, uh, the TDX can block the uh, evoked EPSCs, and uh, the apl application of the uh, potassium channel block for AP can uh, reverse the TTX inhibited, inhibited EPSC. So this suggests that the MPIST neuron form the monosynaptic excitatory synapses with the VTA DA neurons. And later we demonstrate that the MPIST neuron activation can trigger dopamine release in the NAC. 
So we target the chromosome into the MPISD neurons and uh, uh, genetic encoded dopamine sensor DA2H and it's can and uh, it's uh, mutant from DA mutes into the NA NAC and we implanted the fi optic fiber directly above the NAC to measure the dopamine release. And we can find that uh, optogenetic activation of the MPISD neurons induced a uh, face locked robust dopamine release in the NAC uh, detected by the fab photometry. So regardless, the uh, optogenetic stimulation is one second or five seconds. The release of doming in the NAC is both very robust. And we also observed that self-grooming itself, the behavior itself can also trigger dopamine release in the NAC um, also to, to a milder level. And uh, the self grooming in both uh, in physiological conditions or in stressful conditions induced by body restraints, it is associated with dopamine do release in the NAC. We can not observe the differences between uh, the self grooming in different conditions. Then fin finally, we want to uh, know what if we inhibit the MPLST neurons. We target HM40 into the MPRSD neurons, and after uh, CNO mediated chemogenetic inhibition and uh, the and uh, 30 minutes of body restraint, and we subjected the mouse for grooming test, and then subsequently followed by the anxiety related behavior behavior test, including the open field. Uh, elevated plasmids and uh, nobody's breast feeding. First, we observed that uh, camel genetic inhibition of these neurons significantly reduced uh, the grooming times, grooming bouts, and the grooming duration per bout. And uh, subsequently, and then we observed a significant uh, reduce in the center time in the open field and uh, the, the significant uh, a decrease in the open arm times in the elevated plasmids and a significant increase in the latency to feeding, the novelty spread feeding. So these anxiety-related behavior, so these results providing uh, supporting evidence that these neurons, uh, the inhibition of these neurons not only decrease the grooming, but subsequently increase the post-stress anxiety. So this is, uh, uh, so here uh, I make some conclusion of this study. So we uh, find that MPRSD neuron promotes our grooming and display grooming related activities. And the activation of these neurons is rewarding by eliciting dopamine release. And the neuron peptide SAT facilitates the rewarding impact of MPRSD neurons. And inhibition of these neurons impair post stress anxiety regulation. So uh, I would like to thank uh, Sun Yingxing, Wu Xiaohua, and Yuan Yuan, uh, three first authors of this study. And I would also like to thank all the funding to support this study. And uh, thank you. It's long. we're having some trouble hearing you. Um, yeah, yeah, I think we still have a little bit of trouble hearing you, Zlong. So maybe um, while you're sorting that out, I can, I can help. Uh, Kai Wen, uh, do you want to ask your question? Okay, sorry. Hi, Ju. Hi, Ju. Hi. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. It's a Wow, it's a <laughs> tremendous work. So yeah, it's a it's it's very interesting to see it's such a the SST type of neuron and PL neuron have a excitatory. Rose, so do uh, I? I may miss the part. Uh, so how how what is the mechanism underlying this uh, excitatory effect of the uh, MPL SST neurons on on the um, I think VTA or NAC, right? The dopamine release. So they directly activate the 
VTA dopaminergic neurons? Is that what you showed? Uh, yes. Thanks. Yeah, that, uh, thank you for your question. And that's true. So we have two evidence to demonstrate that the mpl acetine neurons form a direct excitatory synapse with the VTA dopamine neurons. So first by electrophysiology, so in using the SD Cree DAD Filippo's mass, we because we do wholesale patch recordings on the dopamine neurons and we activate the MPL acetine neurons and then we can record uh, monosynaptic excitatory uh, responses in the dopamine neuron. So this suggests that they form a direct excitatory synapse. And another evidence that we haven't showed that we performed the, we use in, uh, so by using the AAV, the type one AAV CRE, and we inject into the MPL and uh, inject the um, create dependent so EGF, uh, the AV expressing create dependent EGFP into the EPA, and we can observe that there are EGFP part of neurons which can, uh, by immunostaining, they are co localized with TH. So, these two, uh, this experiment also suggests that the MPL make direct connection with the yeah. VTA. Yeah, okay. so I, I, I guess my uh, my question is, I remember you uh, mentioned that you knocked down, uh, you use crispr cas to knock down uh, SST and the grooming effects is ablated, right? Yes. And so, and but you, you also said you didn't test, you haven't tested glutamate. So I'm just uh, curious how the SST, uh, so you knocked down SST, so which means this type of SST neuron cannot synthesize and release SST. Yes. So you think the SST as a, like a neuropeptide that plays any roles, but like a direct signaling on the, um, the downstream targets or just um, a neuromodulators kind of roles. So I, I'm just uh, getting a little bit confused about how this SST, um, whether this SST directly uh, participates in the excitatory roles of the downstream targets? So actually we investigate the roles of SST in MPL induced reward. So in the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, mediate knockdown of the SD and PDH2, we use ICSS, so intracranial self-stimulation to test the reward effect of these neurons, but we haven't tested the uh, self-grooming. So I think think, uh, so for the glutamate, we think it's the direct effect, so needs a glutamate, but we are not sure about the facilitating effect of SST and PDH2, so we do this, but we are not very sure how SST help the glutamate to play the function. Okay, okay, all right, okay, thank you, yeah, 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 yes, yes, thank you, thank you very much, very, uh, thanks, very yes, nice talk. Thanks, Kevin, now is the uh, scene, please. Hey, uh, Ju, this is Xing. Uh, hi. Hey, hey, uh, very nice work. Very nifty. Uh, I mm -hmm. just have actually very two general questions. So first of all, are there any interaction between the SST neuron? They just actually process information in parallel or they are still actually interconnected? Second one is actually when you do the tracing, use rabies, did you get any any actual input from the sensory cortex. I just wonder whether the sensory input actually will sensitize or suppress this kind of the anxiety related behavior. I just curious. Okay, so let me answer, thank you for your questions and let me answer the second one first. And uh, actually from the rabies virus based retrograde tracings, we saw some inputs from the sensory cortex like here, if you can see my, a slice here. Oh, I see, I see. Oh, sorry. And so, sorry. so here uh, we can see the inputs from the AU. AU means the auditory cortex. So there I are pretty, uh, but we don't know what's the relationship of the sensory input from the auditory cortex to like regulate the, the, the self-grooming behavior or anxiety related behavior. I see, I see. And the IC, so inferior colliculus, I think it's also very closely related with the sensory inputs. 
Yeah, but other other regions are more closely related to the stress response, I think. I see. Okay, wait. And, and oh, the, the, the question, yeah. sorry. Hi, uh, it's a very uh, interesting talk. I just have a, a question. Uh, I remember a few years ago, probably over 10 years ago, a Kuping Fong uh, right now is in the uh, uh, MIT. He showed that there's a protein called a uh, SAP90 associated protein 3, right? SAP AP3. Um, huh. When he genetically deleted that molecule, is leading to OCD. I just wondering if that molecule is highly expressed in the, the neuron you are, you are studying, the you know somatostatin positive neurons. Yeah, thank you for your question. So as far as I know, that neurons play. So that science papers demonstrate that SAPAP3 plays function in the uh, OFC, probably the the the, the cortical and the striatum, the ventral media striatum, to play the functions in the regulation of the. Uh, OCD-like repetitive behaviors, but in that studies, uh, they stimulate the mouse like uh, for. I, so it's like a long-term facilitating the uh, increase in self-grooming and uh, uh, from the manipulation of that genes. So in our, and these proteins, I think, because of the synapse-related proteins, it might be um, expressed in the generally in many neurons, but we haven't looked at the ex specific expression of these proteins in our, so the neuron presented here. Okay, thanks. Uh, Daniel? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, in terms of, uh, thank you for wonderful talk, uh, in, in terms of uh, the grooming behavior, uh, we know it's a very complex uh, behavior so, uh, from the uh, grooming from the mouse area and then to the facial and then uh, further to the body area, so it's uh, sequential uh, behaviors. So in your studies, uh, how did you define those uh, grooming behaviors? And uh, uh, we know some uh, behaviors are uh, physiological state, some as uh, passive physiological state uh, associated with uh, anxiety or some psycho uh, social state. Uh, so if you are uh, differentiated, these are two different states. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So sorry, I have uh, the pro problem. What's the question? Please, so, so, uh, the state, right? So, so you said still question again. Uh, it's very complex. Uh, it's a sequential uh, from the mouse area and to the body areas. Uh, so some uh, uh, occurs uh, occasional uh, one or two times, and some grooming behavior occurs uh, very frequently with uh, uh, multiple. Uh, so some grooming behaviors uh, related with uh, physical uh, state and some uh, with uh, passive physiological state. So how did you differentiate those two states? Uh, yes, I understand. Thank you for your question first. So um, yeah, so in different conditions like the physiological condition and the stressful conditions, the mouse like the self groomings might have like a slightly different synthetic black patterns. And in our studies, actually from the fiber photometry recording to measure the chasm signals, we did not, uh, and I think so, like the whatever, like regardless of like uh, the pet, how the animal complete the patterns, we all observed these neurons activity involved in the groomings. So our, so the self grooming media is by the, by the neurons in this studies actually did not discriminate like a different uh, chains of different, like the different chains of self grooming. But, uh, and for the anxiety, but I think our the neuropsychiatry proposal in this studies uh, pretty, uh, contribute to the like emotional impact of the self grooming because since we observed clearly like uh, the the increased anxiety if we uh, inhibit the self grooming mediated by the MPI neuron. I don't Thank know you. I, I yeah. answer your question. Yeah, great. Yeah, so so I have a quick for comments. I've sent you the paper we we, we published at uh, the end of last year. So where is the autism model uh, we we use in Jinkers lab, so in your, your campus. So it has increasing grooming behavior. 
So we'll, maybe you can try it in the, uh, one of the autism mouse models, see whether this circuitry, particular circuitry is involved in that mouse model. Okay, it's, it's okay, mm -hmm. I, I will send you the paper. Great, thanks, okay. you for a great talk. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for coming, and thank you oh. for your suggestion. Thank sure, you. Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, thank you for a great talk. Now we'll open, uh, going to the uh, waste talk, Aaron. Okay, thanks a lot. Awesome talk, Ju. And um, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Wei Lu, who's our um, next speaker. He's a senior investigator at the NINDS, the National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke at the NIH. He, his uh, laboratory uses a wide range of techniques uh, spanning uh, proteomics, genetics, electrophysiology, uh, behavior, um, all focused on trying to um, figure out mechanisms of synapse uh, development, uh, synaptic transmission. He uh, received his uh, PhD at NYU um, in, in neuroscience, where he worked with Edward Ziff, and here he worked on um, AMPA receptor trafficking. He continued working on AMPA receptors as a postdoctoral fellow at UCSF with Roger Nicole, um, but now he developed a single cell genetic approach and combined it with electrophysiology. And um, he had many papers, but he had one, uh, a very elegant one in neuron, where he tackled the question of how different uh, stoichiometries and glutamate receptor composition um, are uh, important for um, trafficking different receptors into and out of synapses and how this affects synaptic transmission. He uh, started his own lab at um, NINDS where he continues to work on this, expands his the toolbox, um, as well as uh, using his studies of synaptic transmission to figure out how different uh, neuromodulatory neuromodul drugs work. Um, so. Uh, with that, we're looking forward to hearing uh, your latest uh, way. Can you see my screen? Uh, looks good. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Aaron, uh, for the kind of introduction. Also appreciate both uh, you, Aaron, Aaron and uh, Zilong for uh, organizing this seminar series. So today I'm going to share with you some of the recent work in my lab at NIH. So one of the projects over the last several years we have been working on is uh, to study GABA A receptor biology, right? So GABA um, is one of the most abundant, probably arguably one of the most important chemicals in the brain. And its presence in the brain was discovered over 70 years ago in 1950. It is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the mammalian uh, uh, so it mainly acts on the GABA A type ionotropic receptors to mediate the majority of fast inhibitory snap transmission. So GABA A receptors um, uh, and the GABA A receptors mediate inhibitory snap transmission as well as uh, the inhib uh, inhibitory synapses has been implicated in uh, almost every aspect of the brain function. And the dysregulation of inhibitory synapses as well as GABA A receptors has been implicated in the many types of neurological and neuropsychiatry disorders, including uh, epilepsy, autism, and uh, uh, anxiety, and many others. So GABA A receptors are pentameric complexes assembly from uh, 19 different subunits. And, uh, and with assembly rules, still we not fully understand. However, the majority of GABA A receptors in the brain containing two alphas and two beta and one gamma subunit. So as important as GABA A receptors in the brain, for many years, uh, there was no auxiliary supplement has been identified since cloning of GABA A receptors over three decades ago, right? There's no uh, auxiliary supplement has been identified that can impact with GABA A receptors, regulate receptors traffic in kinetics, as well as pharmacology. And this was changed a, a few years ago. There's two transmembrane molecules has been identified. They can impact with GABA A receptors and regulates receptor trafficking to the cell surface or synapses. However, none of these two molecules can modulate GABA A receptors channeled by physical properties, a kinetic properties, and the pharmacology. And indeed, the channel of biophysics or kinetics and the pharmacology of GABA A receptors uh, was, has been thinking, sort of to be exclusively controlled by the channel pore forming side. Right. So uh, today I'm going to uh, uh, discuss uh, different types of GABA receptor of which we have been working on uh, over the last several years. 
It was initiated by a, a postdoc, at the time it was a postdoc, a Wei Yan in the lab, and she's now a research fellow in my lab. And in following years, a different postdoc, Pomui, and a graduate student, David, also joined this project. So uh, there's a family protein called a CCAMP family protein, which stands for cysteine not MPAR except the modulated molecule of proteins. You know, as the name indicated that some members of this family protein has been shown to be MR receptor of the supplements. As you know, MR receptors are one of the major ionotropic good receptors, mediating the majority of files that excite personal transmission. Uh, this family protein also called a Shisa family protein from Shisa 6 to Shisa 9, and they are single mem uh, single transmembrane molecules with a, a characteristic N-terminus uh, uh, cysteine rich domain. So a few years ago, we, we get into uh, interested in these family molecules. Initially, we overexpressed uh, HA tag Shisa family protein. In the following, I just referred to a Shisa family protein in this uh, talk. So we, we overexpressed HA tag Shisa family protein in hippocampal neuronal cultures, then used immunocyte chemistry to study their subcellular localizations. But we found that Shisa 6 and Shisa 9 uh, co-localized with PS95, which is the excitatory post mark but did not co-localize with caffeine, which is an inhibitory post mark which is consistent with previous work as showing that these two molecules intact with MHAR receptors are uh, localized ex excitatory synapses. But to our surprise at the time that when we find that when we overexpress H3 attack, she's a seven, we found that it did not co-localize with PS95 but Kuroka with Gaffrin, indicating that she's a seven, different from these two other members in this family, actually is GABA inhibitory synapse protein. And the she's a eight, another one in the family, not expressed well in hippocampal neurons, so we did not start. So I just want to quickly note, uh, um, uh, mention that before our paper published in 2019, there's a paper published in eLife, shows that when we overexpress she's a seven, uh, prolonged overexpression over one week, can lead into a loss of spines, but those shita seven in those neurons can co-locate with HOMO1. Uh, in our hands, we find that overexpression shita seven prolonged overexpression can lead into a very uh, cell base or, uh, or degeneration of neurons. If anyone interested in the difference between our study with the uh, previous study, we're happy to discuss uh, in the, during the QA time. So this data indicates shita seven is localized at the biological synapses the overexpressed one. So we also raised a monoclonal antibody against endogenous shisa 7 We found that in hippocampal neuronal cultures, endogenous shisa 7 also co-locate with gaffrin. And this antibody is quite specific because in shisa 7 local neuronal cultures, there's no uh, immuno, uh, little immu uh, immuno reactivity. Right? So together, this data indicating that different from other members in this family, shisa 7 is local localized in garbage inhibitory synapses. So the question is now is, what's the function of shita 7 Is it important for the regulation of garbage inhibitory synapse transmission? To study this question, we have generated a shita 7 locale mouse line uh, and then perform electrophysiology recordings. So where we found that garbage synapse transmission in hippocampal C1 hippocampal cells in the hippocampal acute hippocampal slice, the garbage synapse transmission is reduced, but specifically the iPSC frequency is reduced by 50%, and there's little change, no change of uh, the amplitude. Uh, we also collaborated with our labor, Chris McBain's lab um, at NIH, to perform parallel recording. Essentially, we're recording a, a two neurons at the same time. One is pre-synaptic interneurons, in this case, is CCK positive basket cells or CCK positive dendritic typing interneurons. At the same time, record a postsynaptic cell, in this case, is the temple or CA1 parental cells. So in the presynaptic neuron, we can evoke, uh, we, can, we perform a wholesale uh, counter-cramping recording, evoke action potential, trigger uh, neurotransmitter release, in this case, is carbon. So in the postsynaptic neuron, we uh, perform a voltage camera recording, can measure uh, inhibitory transmission IPSCs, in this case, it's a auditory IPSC. What we find is the uretory IBSC between CCK positive basket cells and the C1 parental cells, the amplitude is significantly reduced. And similarly, the uretory IBSC between CCK positive uh, dendritic targeting in the neuron and the C1 parental cells is also significantly reduced. 
So together, these two demons with the Shiva Seva, not only localized at GABA to synapse, but it is important for the regulation of GABA inhibitors and transmission. So the reduction of inhibitors and transmission or IPSC is due to impaired surface expression of GABA receptors. So in this uh, immunocytic chemistry experiment in hip neuronal cultures, we find a surface abundance of the major GABA area of subunits expressed in hippocampus alpha-1 and alpha-2 is significantly reduced in the Shisan 7 local neurons compared to neurons from white eye. And although not showing here, we also performed an EM study showing synaptic abundance of GABA area of subunits in hippocampus A1 region is also significantly reduced in Shisan 7 local neurons. Uh, local neurons. So by chemistry experiments, also demonstrated, uh, further demonstrated that Shisan 7 can form a complex with the endogenous GABA, uh, GABA A receptors in mouse hippocampal lysate. Specifically, Shisan 7 can be co immunized uh, precipitated by GABA A receptor subunits. In this case, it's alpha 2. So, together, these data so far have demonstrated that Shisha 7 is an inhibitory synaptic protein, regulates synaptic abundance of GABA receptors through binding to the receptors. So, the strength of inhibitory synaptic transmission is not only determined by the number of the receptors. In addition to the number of the receptors, the chain of biophysical properties or kinetics also have a profound effect on the strength of inhibitory synaptic transmission. So to study whether Shisha 7 also regulates kinetic properties of GABA receptors, we have performed the user piezo-controlled fast solution application system to study GABA receptor deactivation as well as desynthetization. So with one millisecond application of GABA, with this in this case GABA receptors expressing hex cells, we find that deactivation, the time constant of deactivation, is significantly shorter compared to GABA receptor by itself when co expressed uh, with Shisa 7. And indicated Shisa 7 can speed up the deactivation proceed, um, deactivating of GABA receptors. However, there is no significant change of desensitization when you apply GABA with 100 milliseconds, which can be used to measure de uh, desensitization. And uh, this experiment, we have collaboration with Joe Lynch's lab and the University of Queensland. So conversely, in hippocampal neuronal cultures, uh, uh, in acute hippocampal slides, in C1 parameter cells, mini IPS decay kinetics in the neurons lacking Shisa 7, local neurons, is modest but significantly prolonged. And similarly, the decay kinetics of uritory IPSC between the CCK positive basket cells and the C1 parameter cells is also a significant prolonged indicating the, the importance of Shisa 7 in regulating GABA-8 receptor-mediated uh, transmission through, slow down the, uh, recept, uh, through a speeding up receptor de uh, deactivation and therefore regulates decay kinetics. So in addition to this uh, ma uh, macroscopic current analysis, we also uh, uh, performed the kinetic analysis at a single channel level. In this case, we express our alpha-2 container receptor in HEC2 and 3 T cells, then perform the voltage and current relationship study. And therefore, we can measure the slope conductance. But we found that co-expression Shisa 7 with GABA A receptors did not significantly change the single channel conductance of GABA A receptors. However, what we found is that Shisa 7 can significantly reduce single channel opening uh, frequency in both the uh, isolated single events and also the burst event in the single channel uh, level. And the first analysis demonstrated that the burst duration of the GABA A receptor expression hex cells is, as well as opening a, a probability of GABA A receptors at a single channel level, is significantly reduced by co expression with Shisa 7. Right? So, based on this single channel analysis, this data burst duration and opening probability, we can perform the current simulation to a model the GABA, uh, uh, modulation of GABA receptors by Shisha 7 can model the deactivating process. What we found that in this modeling, we find the co expression uh, Shisha 7 with GABA receptors can significantly reduce the uh, deactivation time constants, which is consistent with our recording data. Uh, I showed a, a few slides before. I demonstrated that Shisha 7 can uh, speed up receptor deactivation. 
So together, this data demonstrated Shiza 7 is different from previous demonstrated GABA A receptor or Zori subgroups. Previous has been showing only regulates receptor trafficking. Now we're showing Shiza 7 is can regulate both the abundance of the receptor at the synapse, but as well as can modulating by physical kinetic properties of this ion channel, chloride permeable ion channel. So there's two major types of GABA A receptor mediated inhibition in the brain. One is a physical inhibition, which is mediated by a synaptic GABA A receptors. As I demonstrated through the major, when you measure mini IPSC, uratory IPSC, or evoked IPSC, those are mediated by synaptic GABA A receptor, so-called physical inhibition. There's a, another types of inhibition called so-called tonic inhibition. And this type of inhibition is mediated by a perisynaptic and an extrasynaptic GABA A receptors. And these receptors typically uh, uh, have high affinity to GABA, therefore can respond to a uh, low concentration of GABA, as well as these receptors are less likely to be desensitized. You can measure this type of inhibition by applying the GABA A receptor antagonist, therefore using electrophysiology, and uh, you can measure the holding current shift. In this case, you can see there's current shift, this atomic current. So the question is, is Shisa 7 in addition to regulating that transmission, is it also important for regulation of tonic inhibition? So what we find is that through the electrophysiology recording in both hippocampal neuronal touches and in acute hippocampal slice recording C1 chemical cells, tonic inhibition mediated uh, in the hippocampal neurons is significantly reduced in neurons lacking of Shisa 7. In addition, we have also isolated uh, uh, identified a specific phosphorylation event in CR7 C terminus, a CR ring 405, which is a PKA substrate. We find this uh, phosphorylation at this site is important for GABA A receptor trafficking to cell service or synapses. And we also made a locking mouse line to mutate these amino acids into RNA, therefore mimicking non phosphorylated form of CR7. And electrophysiology recording in CR1 chemical cells. What we should demonstrate that both physical inhibition and the tonic inhibition is reduced, indicating the importance of these molecular events, uh, uh, post translational modification of Shita 7 is important for the regulation inhibitory synaptic transmission or tonic inhibition by Shita 7. So, so far, uh, all the data demonstrated that Shita 7 not only can regulate a physical or synaptic transmission, as well as can regulate, modulate the tonic inhibition in hippocampus C1 neurons. So in addition to the regulating trafficking, therefore controlling abundance of the receptor at, on, at the cell surface or synapse, as well as connected properties, GABA A receptors are also a prolific targets for a number of uh, therapeutic as well as uh, recreational drugs. This including benzodiazepines as well as uh, general anesthetics, um, like uh, isophorin etonic data proof Propofol is one of the most commonly used general anesthetics in the surgery program around the world. And uh, also the barbiturate and as uh, and as neurosteroid. Ethanol also a uh, uh, GABA A receptor are also a major target of ethanol in the brain. And this compound can induce sedation, hypnosis, euphoria, can also can be used to reduce anxiety, reduce seizure, has been widely used for uh, muscle relaxation and as well as uh, pain management. So as a matter of fact, that's the seven out of top 100 prescribed medicine in the United States as reported in 2018, are targeting GABA A receptors, right? So among these molecules, benzodiazepine is one of the most prescribed medicines around the world. And diazepine is the prototype of benzodiazepine. It's the positive allostatic modulator of, uh, of GABA A receptors. And it, it is, it, it is an active component of this famous medicine banner. In Chinese, it's called the anding. So it, uh, diazepine itself or banning is one of the most pre prescribed medicine. And uh, since it's a commercial launch in the 60s in the last century. So these uh, compounds are a positive allostatic moderate. It means that when you express GABA A receptor in HIC2 and 3T cells, you apply GABA, you can record GABA evoked, GABA A receptor media wholesale current. And this current is potentiated when you co apply GABA together with diazepine, indicating diazepine is a positive allostatic modulator because diazepine by itself, without GABA at this concentration, cannot induce any current in the hex cells, express GABA A receptors. What we found that 
when we co-express GABA A receptor together with the CCR7, the potentiation by diazepine is further enhanced. And in fact, when we, we examine a number of GABA A receptor binding proteins, as well as curative binding protein based on a recent proteomic study, we found that none of other molecules can further uh, enhance diazepine immediate potentiation. Only CCR7 uh, have this um, have, have this role. So conversely, in hippocampal neuronal cultures before uh, prepared from CISA7 knockout or neurons, in wind up neurons, diazepine can induce strong potentiation and when co-applied with GABA. And however, such a potentiation is significantly uh, uh, diminished in the neurons um, uh, lacking of CISA7, right? Should demonstrate the importance of CISA7 regulates psychopharmacology of GABA receptors in the in neurons. So in addition to this cellular study, you recorded in, the, in these cells, and, and the current is regulated by CISA7 uh, response to a GABA A receptor pharmacology. We, find, we also uh, started diazepine action in, the, in live animals. So when we, through the IP injection diazepine in live animals, you can induce hypnosis. Hypnosis is a condition that resembles sleep. In mice, you can uh, uh, study hypnotic effects of diazepine by major loss of writing effects, so-called AOR. So in this, those responses to that study, uh, essentially you inject a different dose of uh, diazepine in, in, through IV injection into uh, animals. We found that in 10 milligram per kilogram, you can indu uh, produce about AOR in 50% of the white type mice. However, none of the locale responds to this dose. In 30 milligram per kilogram, 100% of the white type mice responded. However, still less than 50% of the locale mice responded to this dose. At the highest dose we have examined, 50 milligram per kilogram, we find that 100% of the white high mice responded. But at this very high concentration, if we increase further, essentially, you can kill the mice. We find that still have 30% of the local, she doesn't even local mice, did not respond, did not produce, uh, uh, these dose did not produce LR in local mice. Even in those who responded, the 70%, their, their latency to LR is significantly uh, prolonged. And the duration of AOR in those responding to the locale is much shorter compared to white hat mice. You know, during the time limits, I can show you a movie during the QA time if you're interested in it. Um, so together, these data demonstrate that CISA7 have a unique property in regulating GABA A receptors, not only trafficking kinetic properties, it is also important, it also can modulate the psychopharmacology of, of the receptors, both in vitro, in cultural neurons, in, in cells, in hex cells, but as well as in the live animal. So as I mentioned, the GABA A receptors are major drug targets in the brain. However, many of these compounds I mentioned, benzodiazepine, general anesthetics, or neurosteroids, they can also, they, many of them also highly addictive. They can produce uh, undesirable side effects. When prolonged use, a patient, when you take this drug for a prolonged time, you can develop a tolerance. They also can generate a residual symptoms. Therefore, it's important that it's, uh, uh, have important clinical significance to looking for new compounds target GABA A receptors, they have less or without undesirable side effects. So one way, as I demonstrated that CISA7 has such a unique practice, one way to do this is to uh, looking for a novel, uh, uh, new positive anesthetic module, targeting GABA A receptors in complex with CISA7, instead of GABA A receptors by itself in isolation, which was a practice for the last several decades in the industry, both industry and academic. People categorize Compounds by binds to GABA A receptors use GABA A receptors by itself in isolation without considering native GABA A receptors, which actually in the complex with different auditory supplements, especially with the CISA7, because as we have shown, the CISA7 can regulate psychopharmacology of GABA A receptors. So, with this in mind, we have been a collaborate, uh, collaborate with uh, Dr. Steiner's uh, facility at the NINDS, NIH to use a high throughput label free screen platform to identify compounds bind to cell surface GABA A receptors in complex with the CISA7. So these are very preliminary data. You know, we have screened a few thousands of compounds. So we so far has found a few interesting, uh, uh, interesting need compounds. And, uh, and these electrophysiology data, we 
we just got these, uh, these masks, so very preliminary, need a lot of in-detail study characterization. So what we found so far is that in HEC2 and 3 T cells, when you express GABA receptors, when you apply GABA, you can evoke the core cell current. And as well as when you co uh, express GABA receptors, she's seven, you can also evoke whole cell current. However, when we co apply the compound, one is of the SNC2201. We, we use, right now, we use chem micro because we use this concentration to put in the drug screen. We find that while these compounds can first potentiate a GABA evoked current in GABA receptor by itself, the potentiation, uh, the enhancement of uh, the potentiation is further enhanced when you co express with Shisha cell, indicating these compounds at this concentration shows the sign of differentiate of GABA receptors containing Shisha 7 or without Shisha 7. And a different compound, SNC2202, also shows a similar uh, a result. It seems like it, it can further potentiate the GABA receptor mediated current in presence of Shisha 7 as compared to GABA receptor by itself. So, indicating this a promising uh, approach, we are lead to more characterization. But by the way, you know, these compound by itself cannot evoke a GABA, cannot evoke current in the in the hex cells express GABA receptors, indicating they, uh, this effect is act through the GABA activation of GABA receptors. So we need more characterization of these compounds through a study of dose response curve and as well as characterizing neurons in live animals. Uh, so I hope that through these uh, uh, last 20 minutes, I commence you the Shisa 7 is a unique auxiliary supplement of GABA receptors. It not only regulates receptor traffic into the cell surface as well as to the synapse, can also modulate the kinetic biophysical properties of GABA receptors, as well as to our, we are especially interested as well as the psychopharmacology of these receptors, are important drug targets in the brain. And we also find that these receptors are important for both physic and tonic inhibition, as at least in hippocampal CL1 factor neurons. As I mentioned already, you know, CTA7 complex with GABA receptors appears to a promising targets for the normal development of a new GABA receptor pharmacology, which is we are actively pursuing the lab. So I would like to stop here by acknowledging people again for uh, who did the most of the work I just mentioned, Wen Yan, uh, who has started with this project. And, uh, and uh, she's not right now actually studied the circuit mechanism of, of she's a seven regulation of GABA receptor psych uh, psychopharmacology in mice, in live animal. And Kong Wei is studying the tonic inhibition, regulation of tonic inhibition. And he will study his own lab in China in uh, probably in two months, I believe. And David is a graduate student. And with collaborations with um, this study is, is, was not possible without these wonderful collaborations uh, available at NIH and other points. Um, I would like to stop here and uh, happy to take any question you may have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wei. Awesome talk. Um, time for questions. Um, Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Wei. Hi, hi, yeah. May I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. A uh, very, very, very interesting talk. Um, I, uh, I have a question about uh, the uh, Shisha 7 uh, interaction with the uh, GABA receptors. So do you guys know like at like molecular level, like, you know, why Shisha 7 uh, alters the uh, potentiation of uh, uh, diazepam for uh, the GABA current? What is the reason? Right, so, you know, I did not, because of the relatively short talk here, you know, we, I did not show, we, did, we have molecular that of course it's not directly in terms of modulating diazepam, but in terms of binding, why Shisha 7 can bind? When you do sequence alignment of different Shisa, you know, Shisa 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, Shisa 7 have a unique insertion in the N terminus, about 20 amino acids, which is not uh, uh, present in other members in this family. We find that that's domain is critical for binding of uh, GABA receptors. Uh, but if that domain is important for psychopharmacology uh, regulation of uh, pharmacology of GABA receptors, is, is not known. Um, but to answer your question in terms of how, why it regulates GABA receptor pharmacology, I think we probably need to do a lot of mutations or use the cryo EMs to study, you know, develop those uh, crystals or, you know, um, use cryo EM in presence of different compounds. 
So uh, with Shisha Seven, um, the GABA current is uh, is small or uh, is smaller, right? With the Shisha Seven, the wholesale current is bigger. Without the Shisha Seven, when you the genetic lock current, the current is reduced. Okay, so um, so with Shisha Seven, the baseline baseline current are already bigger, and the potentiation is even bigger. Uh, it means in terms of diazepam. Like that, like okay, I right. see. Without a shita seven, you know the diazepam. Diazepam is a positive aristic gamma receptor. No matter you have shita seven or not, that most gamma current, right? You know gamma a gamma induced gamma receptor mediated current. But with co-expansion with the shita seven, such a potentiation can further enhance. Okay, so uh, well, then I'm, I'm curious about the composition of uh, GABA receptors. I mean, we, we, like a, a different brain region or different type of cells. Yeah. I mean, do we always have a such a seven or like a different regions, different cell types have diversity? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, quite a widely expressed. When you look at the uh, brain atlas, you know, it's quite a widely expressed, but not expressing every neurons. You know, a lot of interneurons don't have, but it's, some interneurons have very high level. Uh, you know, certain brain regions have a very high expression in like cortex cameras, some neurons in the uh, subcortical nuclei, but not, not a kind of uniformly high, you know, it shows differential expression. Okay, cool. Yeah, I still have a lot of questions, but let's talk later, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hey, Fujian. Oh uh, yeah, uh, very nice work we so. Yeah, I just have a, uh, uh, one question. So regarding the the Shisa seven, so you mentioned uh, you show that when you knock out Shisa seven, you saw this uh, significant reduction in the uh, impact receptor abundance, right? But you didn't see any change in the mini uh, IPSC amplitude, but you see a, a increase in the frequency. So it seems, uh, what's your explanation for this uh, two kind of uh, contradictory result? Right. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can still see the see, see my screen or not. Can you see, still see my screen? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm glad that you raised this question. Right. You know, we showed that when you do mini recording, there is a change of mini frequency, but not amplitude. I forgot to mention that there is no change of pair to pulse ratio. You know, through both uh, uh, you know pair recording as well as the uh, evoked you put the electrodes in the C1 uh, radiatum. Uh, there's no change of pure power ratio indicating the presynaptic release probability of GABA is not ordered in, in the Shiraz even knockout neurons. So why the only frequency change but not amplitude is because we find that when we do EM study, there is many synapses. It's not a, uh, so there's one possibility when you see frequency change but not amplitude is because a subpopulation of synapses the MR, uh, the gamma A receptor is reduced so much, therefore the events are you cannot detect. It. Therefore appears like a mini frequency reduction. Although those M gamma A receptors, uh, excuse me, it's gamma A receptors. Gamma A receptors abundance is reduced so much, therefore looks like those the synapse become silent. Therefore appears like a mini frequency change, but not M, because those no amplitude events already below detection threshold. I hope this uh, answer your question or is still. I okay, I guess that was, that was good. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay. So thanks, Wei. That was a great talk. And um, thanks also, Ju, for a really amazing talk as well. Um, Looking forward to seeing everyone next week. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Wait. Yeah, Thank I have a good question to ask you later. Oh, cool. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Wei. Thanks, Chi. See you all next week. I see you. Bye.